Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, so we are about to start. I'm just going to check what do we have with the connection. And uh, if I can see, I can invite our guest. Okay, while well, I can see Mark, uh, our guest joined, but uh, just let's uh, have a few minutes to see if he can join the feed successfully. So to start today's artist talk, um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Alina Osorova. And uh, on behalf of Compulsive, uh, I welcome you to the opening of our spring edition. It's called Spring Pools. And it's a program of eight weeks of different audiovisual experiments. <clears throat> this is the third pools that we're doing. Uh, last time, it was one year ago. Um, what's ahead of us? So for this program, uh, we also <coughs> make works ourselves and I'm just gonna very shortly <laughs> very soon mention um, people who are beyond compulsive and we also invite people that we work with people that we like our friends uh, interesting audiovisual artists and one of them is uh, Mark Eiserman whose uh, audiovisual experiment we've been showing this week starting on Thursday uh, a few words about Compulsive. Compulsive is a platform for sound art and even broader audiovisual art that goes a little bit beyond traditional practices, institutions and venues. And especially during the time when we still are, um, let's say, opening and closing culture, um, going um, in the direction of digital presentation and online presentation, I think it helps to many of us to keep ourselves fit in shape to give us extra deadlines and also to connect to the public. Um, I want to uh, also introduce the possibility for those of you who are joining us to ask your questions uh, by the end of the session. For that, I guess you know how it works in Instagram, you just need uh, to edit as a comment in the uh, little window on the bottom of your, of your screen to the left. All right, um, can we uh, now try, uh, Mark, to um, have you <laughs> sharing the screen with me? Hey, Mark. Yes. So. Hi. Gonna have to try again. Yep. Hey. <laughs> Good Thank to see you. Thank you for joining. Um, you are our very first guest of this uh, new Spring Pulse program, and you're also a friend of mine. Um, I'm super happy that you uh, managed to have time. I know you are quite busy, um, that um, we can have this live conversation. And um, Mark Eiserman, um, we uh, met with Mark actually a year ago, and that was uh, sort of accidental, but non-accidental as well. We've been both invited by uh, our friend Adi Hollander to join the other abilities uh, research uh, that actually was starting more or less as well one year ago. And uh, this is how I know Mark. Yesterday, yeah. actually, <laughs> yesterday we also had a, a short uh, um, professional meeting um, documenting the installation that I probably uh, would mention a bit later in this conversation. Um, Mark is presenting during this week uh, his uh, experiment that is also a part of a kind of larger um, series of works or a part of a bigger context. It's called They Were um, Water People. And we already shared the link to this work uh, this Thursday. This work will stay online on our Pulse channel throughout these four days, uh, with the Sunday as the last day to see. So if you haven't seen it yet, please <laughs> follow the link. It was in the previous post. All right, I've done my <laughs> official presentation <laughs> part. With uh, one year of a gap, it's uh, <laughs> not so easy, let's say, to, um, to not be a bit nervous. 
but um, I would like to uh, maybe give uh, here uh, the screen to the Mark, to Mark, uh, asking um, to let's say share with us the particular focus of his practice because. Also, as you could probably see in the interview that uh, um, we shared in one of the posts, uh, Mark works with a lot uh, of different media and different technologies uh, from AI to, uh, let's say, other technologies allowing the public to interact with pieces. But I'm not going to tell too much. Uh, I will ask Mark to do that. Thanks so much. And thanks for the invitation, uh, first and foremost. Um, yeah, about my practice. So uh, I come from a background in sound art. Um, and I have been working um, for my own in my own practice since about 2015, 2018, when I started more with audiovisual performances, trying to combine, for example, uh, archival video footage with um, uh, things like uh, uh, shaders and kind of exploring technology. Uh, because from an early age, I was already always uh, working with technology and I studied music and technology. Um, so it was logical to explore kind of more uh, those uh, those things in depth. And at some point you come, you hit a wall, right? So you hit a wall and you want to kind of uh, say, okay, how, what can I say? What can I, how can I expand my practice uh, in a way? And what was interesting to me was not anymore the technologies because every week there's something new and this is, it's always going on, right? So um, uh, I started looking for ways of telling new kind of stories. And uh, uh, a big change came when, back in 2019, I did a residency together with Sebastian Robert, right? so I was also joining in the, in the people who are viewing now, so it's really nice. And we, um, uh, together we worked on an audiovisual performance called As Above, So Below, in which we look at deforestation in South Central Chile. Um, kind of telling this story, uh, this complex kind of intertwined story of um, local indigenous people, uh, the, the, the way they manage their land, uh, but the fact that they're also stuck in a capitalist system and have to deal with this uh, um, deforestation uh, issues uh, through an uh, audiovisual piece. So this was the first time I got to kind of tell a broader story uh, um, with my art. And that was, yeah, the, that was a big change for me back in 2019. And since then I've been focusing my practice more and more towards also ecology. Um, and still using the, the position that I have, using uh, being able to really pick up technologies quite quickly uh, to, uh, to tell these stories in different ways. <laughs> Thank you for this very, very kind of condensed <laughs> description of also how your practice was developing. And um, I wanted to link uh, these last things you said about ecology also with the place where you're teaching. Because yeah. the faculty that you're part of is also called Ecology Futures, right? Yeah, so there's a, a Ecology Futures is a master's program or actually it's a pathway uh, within the Master's Institute of Visual Cultures in uh, Den Bosch, uh, which is part of Sint the St. Joost Art Academy here in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, there they have different pathways, so ecology future, situated design, and visual arts. And when you're a student there, you get to kind of pick from all of the, this, those different pathways. And I teach within ecology futures, where we also uh, uh, talk about this intersection between uh, art, specifically more media art, um, and, uh, and ecology. So how can we tell kind of uh, uh, stories, or how can we uh, work with uh, the theme of uh, ecology and changing ecology, climate uh, emergency, et cetera, within, uh, within an arts context. Uh, and I really um, I'll always look up to my students because they have kind of, they have to mitigate this every day, right? So they have to mitigate the fact that they, some might not want to, again, use certain materials or uh, put a, a project on a, a Google server because it also uses uh, um, a lot of energy resources um, to tell a story. So you always have to ask this question of there's this balance between how, what are you using and what are you um, uh, uh, yeah, what do you, what do you want to tell? So is it worth it to use that, et cetera? So it's really nice to be able to teach here. And then within uh, my class that I teach together with uh, Jarl Schulp, um, the, the director of Fiber Festival, 
uh, he, we teach a module called um, Cartographies of the Vanishing Now, which is about uh, looking at um, former places of extraction. So uh, for the last two years, we've been focusing on uh, a defunct mine in the south of the Netherlands, uh, where the first uh, cement industry uh, was founded. And we ask our students to make a project about that. And it's a very interesting uh, place for that because um, this mine has this long history. It started back in the, the early uh, 20th century. And now only two, three years ago, they stopped the factory and they stopped the mining and they're giving it back to nature. And that already is a very interesting question. Like, what does that mean? Um, so we go there twice, once with, uh, um, uh, this year we in invited uh, uh, Sharon Renee Stewart, who is a deep listening expert. And she kind of did a kind of a exercise where we got to know that space through listening. And the second time we went there with people from Natur Monumenten, um, who uh, kind of govern that area within uh, Maastricht. Uh, so we get to know this place in different ways. And then we ask our students to make a project about it. And this is, yeah, th this can be, uh, because it's a very layered complex place. This can be all kinds sorts of projects. And there will be some kind of showcase for their works, right? I guess. Yeah, so this is only one uh, class. So like a 10 week class. Um, I guide the students throughout the whole year. Um, but then uh, there will be a showcase, I think in May, at V2 in Rotterdam, which is funny because I'm also working with V2, but it's uh, they're doing great work. <laughs> it's a great platform. Going to Rotterdam and V2, I wanted to compliment your official photographer. <laughs> oh, thank I, you. If I can call Adriana like this, <laughs> because um, yeah, I, I, I've sort of um, seen your field trips in uh, Rotterdam and in the harbor through the lens of uh, Adrian and their kind of big applause on the documentation. Um, but before we jump into the port uh, and into the problematics or the wider context of this um, latest experiment that you shared with us, I also wanted to ask um, just maybe um, a little thing about the storytelling that you were describing, storytelling of uh, non-human stories, yeah, of, uh, of earth or of ecologies, but also uh, of creatures that uh, otherwise cannot speak for themselves. Creatures yeah. or entities, yeah? And here I'm, I'm referring to this work uh, that I, I had a chance to see yesterday. It's an, uh, it's an um, art museum in Leiden and it's called Human, uh, Humans Talk to Me. And who, who is asking that question or who is giving this uh, suggestion? Yeah, so Humans Talk to Me is a collaboration I did with a uh, writer, biologist, and um, uh, world traveler, uh, Rita Bayens, uh, uh, also with uh, Eke Brusse and designer Axel Koemans. And uh, it was created for an open call by the Lake Hall in Leiden. And um, for this uh, exhibition, they were asking people to come up with uh, ideas for installations about um, growth, growth that went beyond control, that went out of control. Um, and what we came up with, Arita had already been busy with trying to uh, find a voice for the North Sea. So I worked together with Arita um, to train an artificial intelligence model um, on different, more poetic texts of the North Sea. Um, so it could kind of gain a voice of its own. So it, it's using these um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence text models uh, to create a, a new voice for the North Sea. Of course, you cannot, uh, you can only do that. What better way than words, right? I mean, humans use words. So I really like this idea of using words, something that the sea will probably not never have to kind of explore if that is. Uh, uh, possibility. So we trained this AI model and then it started also coming up with its own words, like gnabben, for example, which is a word which sounds very Dutch, but it doesn't exist. So through this, we want to rewild the Dutch language um, as the, the Dutch 
have a very technocratic way of talking about stuff. Also, what should be in the North Sea? Like, are we building a new wind farm? Are we doing this? Blah, blah, blah. So it's always very utilitarian. And um, we want to kind of challenge that by trying to give the North Sea also a voice. So in this installation uh, that you and I also visited yesterday, which is nice, um, you can, uh, you're invited to kind of lie down in this, um, uh, yeah, bowl of fish nets, old fishing nets. And then you can ask the North Sea a question by using your voice. Um, so you can say, hey, North Sea, like you would address Siri, for example, and they will say, okay, what do you want to trust to me or what do you want to tell me? You can tell the North Sea something, you will get an answer. And these answers are mostly quite poetic, but sometimes there's a really nice kind of, yeah, uh, thing that happens where it lines up with your, uh, uh, with your question, the answer. Um, so the work is uh, in Dutch. Uh, yeah. And I remember that you were mentioning that it's also, uh, let's say, the system is a bit picky about the accent yeah, within the Dutch language. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the like accent to address a Nord Zee in this case. Yeah, so this is the friction. This is a friction in my own work where uh, I also use these technological means. In this case, there was also like go a Google service that was used uh, to make sure that you could talk to the North Sea. Um, which, of course, there is a friction because it uses these uh, these technologies these uh, that also use energy again. Um, so, but I kind of like this friction and I feel comfortable in it. And it's something I can keep thinking about. Yeah. And <laughs> you said you trained the AI on poetic texts, uh, but uh, I just wanted to ask, they were coming from, uh, I don't know, let's say Dutch folklore or the world uh, literature, what kind of te texts you were using? There, there's uh, like maritime dictionaries in there. So with all kinds of words that you don't normally use. Um, there is uh, indeed like uh, uh, poets and stuff in there. So there's a lot of different kind of uh, um, material in there, which is very nice. And it creates for a nice uh, combination of uh, text that can appear. So it's really cool. And this, uh, this kind of new, uh, new terminology or new lexics, uh, are you able to capture uh, somehow these things that the AI comes uh, up with? Yeah, so um, Arita is doing a project connected to this where she will, using the same kind of artificial intelligence text model, where she uh, uh, invites people to ask a question to the North Sea so you can send them to her. And she will kind of, uh, uh, with our um, AI machine, generate an answer of the North Sea for you. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, uh, resulted in super nice kind of um, uh, back and forth of questions and answers from from our uh, North Sea artificial intelligence text model. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, to not drift away <laughs> too far, let's say from the also the work on show. Um, yeah. Let's. Um, I would. I wanted to ask you uh, about the broader context of uh, this experiment that you shared with us. Uh, they were water people. Yeah. And, uh, I know it's also part of a longer a residency that you're doing, and it's one of the let's say one of the steps on the way to a final presentation of your research, and it happens in Rotterdam. Uh, you are, by the way, uh, based, uh, you're an artist based in Amsterdam. So you're commuting there quite a lot. You're also collaborating with uh, biologists there. And maybe you can tell us uh, how, how did it start? So there's, um, this is a residency that was funded for by Starts, which is an EU-based, uh, um, uh, yeah, for a kind of art fund for uh, science, technology, and the arts. And they, the idea is that artists can also propel um, science and technology forward with their projects. Um, and I was very happy to be accepted for Starts for Water, which is a program that focuses on water management in all kinds of different uh, places in, in Europe. So me, together with nine other artists, were selected to um, tackle different kind of water management issues. And I was selected for the biodiversity in the port of Rotterdam uh, uh, open call, which is fo focusing specifically on the um, port of Rotterdam. Uh, and um, I was already in Amsterdam. I was uh, focusing on this small sea creature, this maritime uh, circulate, like a tube worm, 
that wasn't here before. Like uh, the, you have to imagine because of climate change and the oceans rising and um, kind of salt water um, getting more and more inland, we, uh, we're seeing kind of a change in species. And when I asked one of the um, city ecologists here in Amsterdam, like what is one of the species which you've only recently started seeing, he, uh, said, he said to me that this Australian tube worm is the one that, that is quite new. So uh, I was focusing on that and Amsterdam was trying to create like a sound walk uh, around this species, but then I thought, it's so weird that we're doing, we're making so many, so much like ecological art um, uh, around, yeah, focused on virtual environments. So in VR or uh, um, 3D environments or game engines. And I started wondering, don't we lose the connection with the natural world even more when we do that? So it's kind of strange for me to make a, a work about the sea creature that I've never even seen from up close. Of course, I don't mean we should start fishing the oceans and kind of just looking at every fish or something. But there, there is something to say for knowing the material that you're telling a story about, of course. And now you have an aquarium, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm an artist who normally uses a lot of computers, and now suddenly I have an aquarium in my studio. So it's, uh, it's weird how uh, your artistic practice can develop. Um, so I, start, I was interested in the sea creature, and then I applied for this residency. Um, which is commissioned by V2 and uh, part of this uh, EU fund, fund. And um, then I started researching, are these sea creatures even there in, uh, in, in the Rotterdam Harbor? And it turned out they are. Um, after a while, it took some time to find them. And the first time I went there, only with the photographer that you mentioned, with Adrian, uh, we didn't see anything like we didn't see where life is no. was there even life in the Rotterdam port we were at mass flock today it was huge and we couldn't find a lot of species at all but and, this were walking above the water level yeah yeah we were walking about above the water level I was carrying my uh, my little net and we were looking for can we like what species are here and actually there's an other artist Fritz Haag, who, who's done a piece about this, where he put these kind of traffic signs, you know, like a stop sign, um, uh, all around the uh, the area, the the new area of the port, like the mass flock and stuff, with animals on it. So uh, um, you won't see them, but these frogs are here. You won't see them, but these uh, these doves are here. So this is kind of a nice intervention. But I still wanted to look for the real uh, the real deal. So. I was really happy that I got in touch with Peter Paalvast, who's a biologist who works for the Port of Rotterdam. And um, uh, I get to tag along on his trips. And he's doing research into the shipworm, which is a worm that eats wood. And it kind of uh, eats its way into uh, also the, the, the wooden poles that the harbor is kind of resting on, which is, of course, not good because of the wood kind of is petrified and will... The, the, the port will collapse. So he's doing reports about this uh, and I got to tag along and we found a lot of species and I got to know uh, the life in the port uh, from very close close by, which was super nice. And that's also what you can see in the pictures that you uh, shared on your Instagram uh, channel. Yeah, as I think uh, for, if you guys want to go uh, later and check those amazing pictures that we <laughs> keep talking about. Uh, so there, there are uh, some images when uh, you and Peter are dragging sort of like a rope with a stack of wooden things. And this is a basically scientific instrument to measure the exhaustion. I, I, this is how I interpret it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing that Peter does, he makes these, uh, these <laughs> they're almost cultural, right? So he yeah. makes these kind of, um, puts his wooden planks together and then he puts those in the water for a year and he comes back after a year, drags them out and he takes these wooden planks and then gives them to a radiologist who makes, makes an x-ray of it. Mm -hmm. And then you can see exactly how many um, chipworm there are within this uh, little plank. Uh, so that's what his research consists of now, but he has done a lot and now he's again researching, uh, I believe, um, a lichen uh, in the port of Rotterdam. So he's doing a lot of this work, but he was uh, and is essential to, uh, to the research that I'm doing. But I'm focused on this uh, uh, Australian tube worm, of course. Um, 
And was and, the first time that you met your, you know, your collaborator there in Rotterdam when you could actually, you know, have it in your hands? Oh, the 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 tube room. Now already between Amsterdam and Zaandam, there's also some places where the water. That's the turbidity zone where uh, salt and sweet water kind of meet, uh, and if the levels are right, then the uh, this tube worm really likes that, and then it will start kind of growing and uh, um, yeah, kind of uh, developing. So, uh, to, but to, just to explain, these these tube worms, they're uh, uh, species that kind of build reefs, calcaceous reefs which can form up to like four meters in uh, width, which is insane. Um, and I got interested in this in the port of Rotterdam because I thought there's an interesting connection between the infrastructures, the huge infrastructures that we built there. It's really, it's insane. Like when we were driving around there, I thought it would never end. It's, uh, you it's can easily, <laughs> yeah, 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 you can drive 200 kilometers in one day and you've only seen a bit of it. It's crazy. Uh, and for an artist, uh, an artist without a driver's license is not uh, <laughs> it's not like not such a, a easy thing. But um, um, but then I thought, okay, we have these huge infrastructures, and apparently there is this small invasive species, which they call an invasive, um, which has been been there only since the 70s, um, and it's clogging up the pipes of our infrastructures. Uh, uh, but it's only an invasive species to us. Like for other species really like this species because it gives them shelter, it gives them food. Um, so I thought there was an interesting connection there. And what if this, isn't this Australian tube or maybe a, a, a signifier for the future when we will have to give the part of Rotterdam also for a big part back to the North Sea. And in, um, since we're now talking about the future and what might come, um, there is also a part of the past that uh, for now is incorporated in this um, audiovisual work in progress that you shared. Um, I have to say, <laughs> I, I shared this with you yesterday, I have to say when I was watching your work, uh, I imagined uh, somehow, or like my imagination took me to uh, other seas and to the seas uh, that very uh, long time ago, some centuries ago, the pirates were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told you yesterday that the singing, uh, this kind of rhythmic uh, professional singing to the sea, to the port about uh, what people, you know, that was, let's say, the 24-7 uh, vocation for these people, which is also slowly disappearing. So all this, and especially, uh, the way uh, people in a choir are situated, you know, next one, next to another one, next to another one. It also reminded me somehow of this the tube worm colonies. And that, <laughs> again, reminded me of uh, the Pirates of Caribbean and the <laughs> creatures that were also growing, uh, growing some sea stuff on their faces. Uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit uh, where, the, where the singing and where the choir comes from? Oh, you just dropped a bit. But where the thing I came from? The choir. The choir. Okay, so um, the 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 choir is kind of a recent kind of thought experiment, which I incorporated in the experiment for uh, for compulsive, um, because I wanted to grow this tube worm on an object which signifies endless economic growth. So uh, it could be a container, it could be an oil drum. I still am thinking about that, what that could be, a container crane, what have you. But then I thought, okay, and then I've done that, but how do I also circle it back to the human level? Like there's this level of the port, a huge infrastructure, there's this micro level of a, a sea creature, but how do I involve our human level? And what, what, what better way through song, right? Or uh, it's something which a song is very uh, relatable. Uh, it also can bridge kind of future and past. Um, and there's a lot of these sh sea shanties, like the seafaring songs that they would sing while hoisting the sail, for example, uh, to kind of keep rhythm. Um, and uh, then I thought, okay, this is a good way because it's also a practice that di that's disappearing to kind of involve these singers um, to bring it back to the human level. So I started working 
with them for that. And it's also an experiment in the, in the work where I just use recordings that were already there. But I plan on, in the final work, having the singers not as a group, even though I like your idea of that they are kind of like a colony. Um, but I would like to have them very uh, pure by themselves. Um, also to kind of lament the fact that this, uh, uh, that this practice is also disappearing, as well as the port can continue, can sustain itself anymore in this way. So that, that, that's kind of the idea behind that. But I'm still kind of working through uh, what exactly it should be. In, in, in general, this uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> singing or uh, vocal practice attached to a vocation, it's something quite collective. Yeah, you, you don't necessarily sing this thing, you know, under the shower <laughs> or while, while doing something alone. Uh, so in a way, it belongs to a community uh, yeah. uh, that was sharing the same way of life. And of course, nowadays it's... Uh, not quite the same as it used to be. But uh, when you're saying that uh, one of the possible ideas is to take them in a more, let's say, clean, clear way, one by one, it also reminds me, you know, of something towards museology um, approach when, when, you know, it's a practice that uh, we need to preserve because it's almost uh, disappeared and uh, it becomes more like a museum object in a way. Yeah, so you're taking it apart then to kind of understand it in a better way. Yeah, I have to say that the choir that I'm working with was also kind of reluctant uh, because they uh, they also told me, but, you know, we do this as a, as a collective. We do this as a whole. Like, it doesn't make sense to do it uh, just with one uh, singer. But still, I think there's a power in that. When you sing, for example, the, the song that I chose, which is part of the video that is on, uh, on your channel, um, the, or the, part, the bits that I chose from that, um, they are all about, uh, okay, the, it's called the harbors of Rotterdam, and the harbors of Rotterdam, on the, on the harbors of Rotterdam. Um, and it's about how it was, is, and always will be the same. Yeah. And my work is about how this is going to change. So I think if then they are seeing this kind of fragile by themselves, I think this could be a very strong, uh, a strong signal or strong element to incorporate into the work. In, in general, I think on a personal level for them, that's going to be quite a vulnerable position because in a choir, you know, you also rely a lot on, on the one voice on the left and another one on the right. So it could be interesting, you know, almost like interesting psychological experiment uh, to know how, how did that feel <laughs> for them. Yeah, of course, they will have like their, their uh, um, uh, director um, as well as uh, the one, a musician there. And I will do some, some stuff to kind of keep it so uh, uh, they won't feel alone. But I still have to think about that. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> As I was saying, um, I think in my introduction that um, the works that we show during our Pulse program, some of them are created specifically for uh, online presentations. So these are new works, but some other works are brought into the program in during the moment when the artist is actually working on it. So they are works in progress or they are experiments that uh, can benefit from this presentation from the questions, uh, from let's say the uh, the feedback of of the viewers. That uh, brings me to the uh, one of the final. <laughs> I have to say, it's super interesting to talk, but I also don't want to make it forever. Uh, um, I wanted to remind that you guys who are watching us, you can also uh, ask us uh, questions by typing them in the bottom left little box that you have on your screen. Uh, if you write it there, I will be able to read it to Mark. Well, actually, Mark, you also will see these questions. So we're going to give you a few minutes maybe to come up with uh, something. And um, while we're waiting, I also wanted to ask, as always, we try to ask um, our guests about the next uh, exciting step that <laughs> you're trying to take. Um, I could hint into certain directions that I would be curious to know, but I will <laughs> give you the full freedom to <laughs> take us well, first and foremost, I really look forward to uh, developing this project more, like this They Were the Water People um, that I'm working on, which is still the working title as well. 
Uh, and it's such a privilege to get this funding from the EU to be able to do a project which is so long because I started with this in November and the, the uh, final exhibition isn't until September of this year. So that's quite a lot of time, big chunk of time. And that's, yeah, it's a, I've never had that experience. Normally I work in chunks of three months and then a project has to be finished. Um, and it's, it's, it's super nice to be able to also try out stuff along the way, like with Compulsive, but also with the 3x3 program of V2. Uh, and I look forward to see where my research within this will take me. Uh, but talking about other projects, um, uh, uh, Sebastian Robert, who I work a lot with, and me we were invited to uh, do a, a work, make a work for, for Schemerlicht in, uh, in uh, uh, Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, something with air air quality, it's not completely clear, but we're all, it will also be a research-based work, also working with um, uh, specialists and researchers from the uh, local university there. Uh, so that will be uh, quite interesting. Um, then uh, I recently had a work in the International Space Station. It's already, uh, it's it, it's already there, yeah. With, uh, with um, the Moon Gallery, which is a, a foundation that intends to put art on the moon uh, now by 2025. Uh, it was delayed a few years, but you know, space faring, <laughs> stuff happens. It's tiny art, right? It's tiny art, yeah. So it's a, it's a gallery of um, eventually 10 by 10 uh, by one centimeter. And every artist gets one by one by one centimeter. So... Uh, that's not a lot of space, so you have to come up with a great idea um, to uh, to put it in that small box. And the work that I did is called Plitschknasterpsch, and it's a work where I take onomatopoeia, those are sound words like kataklop or uh, splish or something like that, of different cultures, and I put them in uh, this small one by one by one centimeter by using a small chip and a light, which blinks them out as Morse uh, oh, code. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a sound work without sounds in space. So it's nice to be a part of. I see that we have a question. Yeah. Um, while you're reading the question, I also want to say that we're going to leave a few links about uh, the, the exhibitions that we'll be talking about. So let's say in, in, in relation to the moon, um, moon project, <laughs> we're going to also leave you a link that you can check how, uh, how it was. Uh, so, I'm also reading this question from Arzu. Arzu is uh, my colleague. She's also a founding member of Compulsive. Um, and I'm going to also read it quickly. So, uh, Arzu's question, Arzu's first question is about um, what can, uh, well, you mentioned the possible disconnect that working with new media can create to our natural environment. Uh, what would your shout out be to what art slash sound slash media arts can do? Uh, that's a difficult question, of course. Um, but um, I think being close to that material, really getting to know the material, which is also what I'm uh, doing with this tube worm in a, in a sense. But this is also something I'm, uh, I'm, of course, thinking about. And what I noticed with earlier works is, of course, you can sit at home, use uh, things like Google Maps and Google Earth to kind of create a work. Uh, but then uh, you could make a work about mines just by using a satellite uh, data, of course. But then you don't know what it is like or you don't know what it feels like. So it, it's, it won't, will never be um, as embodied for you as an artist. So to spread these stories, I think, there's a certain level of embodiment that uh, that you need to also uh, have. So you need to be out in the field. You need to kind of be able to touch the ground. You need to be able to kind of feel what that space is, uh, is like. Um, Did Arzu have another question? Uh, what is your takeaway from working with technology slash ecology in the arts? I think it's kind of uh, the, the, the same... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it hints at the same, like Arzu is already saying. Um, yeah, I think it, it hints at the same thing. And I think technology is, I, I like the friction between the two because it allows me to kind of explore this infinitely, you know? So it's, 
the, there's a friction between using this technology and uh, talking about ecology uh, and wanting to be in the field. And this is something uh, I can navigate for the rest of my practice, I think. So I don't see it as something that I need to solve because that would then I would be done. <laughs> no. And I remember this uh, actually from the conversations I think we had uh, in summer during the other abilities project uh, that also working with technology uh, is, let's say, bringing another perspective into uh, other agents that are non-human agents and the, uh, let's say, the agents that can communicate with each other without, you know, using any um, uh, single systems that are available to humans. Yeah. So by using, uh, you, can, you can create networks of, uh, you can simulate this, this kind of other than human uh, interaction, of course. Sorry, I didn't, uh, <laughs> do you want to specify your question? Or? It was, I think it was just, I was remembering things from Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of, the, one of the works I did earlier, which also led to the starts work, is more of an experiment and was called... Uh, uh, a barnacle's guide to climate change, where I uh, kind of made an artificial intelligence barnacle uh, that talks about um, uh, talks about the human from the perspective of the of the barnacle. So I trained an uh, AI text model on lots of texts about barnacles, and then flipped it around so it talks about humans from that from the perspective, which also then talks about, okay, the language that we use to talk about these other than human uh, uh, sea creatures. So that's, yeah. I think, I, I think maybe it's also would be great to, um, if you can send me the link uh, of that project, I would include it in the description. Yeah, and it's on my video as well. Redirect people over there. Uh, we have to close this second session and uh, first I would like to thank you Mark for joining us and also to remind uh, to you guys that uh, we are, they were the, they were water people is available still online um, until tomorrow evening on the Pulse channel, the links and everything I think we already shared many times but I will repeat it. And uh, very briefly I wanted also to introduce the next artist that uh, who's coming um, following week. Uh, her name is Joana Mandrescu. She is also a funding member of uh, Compulsive Platform. And um, on Thursday, we will launch, uh, let's say, uh, make online available access to her new work. And on Saturday, we will have another talk. Um, later on, we will also publish all these talks on our website. And all the links will follow very shortly <laughs> on our social accounts. Thank you very much for joining everybody. Thank you for questions and uh, have a great uh, end of this uh, beautiful sunny day, at least how it was in Amsterdam. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Alina. See you soon. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>